Grant Lawrence joins me in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Hello. Hey, thank Welcome. you. Th yeah, it's great to be back. Thanks well, for nice having me. Nice to have me. you back on, and congratulations on the birth of another book. Thank you. You know, I mentioned that growing up Canadian, it's almost expected that you're passionate about hockey, and especially with parents like yours, who, mm -hmm. who were big hockey fans. At the start of the book, uh, let's start with this anecdote. You mentioned a connection with the Canadian national team that yes. seems like it would be the perfect launching point for to, to a preordained hockey career. Yeah, the baptism. Share, share that story. If you yeah, want. sure. Uh, okay, so my, my mom always considered herself the most unlucky person. She never won anything. And then uh, this one particular summer, uh, possibly the greatest summer uh, in uh, Canadian sporting lore, uh, ironically, uh, with a winter sport, uh, was the summer of uh, 72, the, the September. Exactly, the Summit Series, uh, Canada versus Russia. And uh, those four games that occurred in Canada were in such high demand for uh, the games in Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg, and Vancouver that they held a, a national lottery uh, to, to win tickets. And my mom, uh, uh, being a big hockey fan, put her name in, and lo and behold... She won tickets to the Winnipeg game. Yeah. Now, my family was in Toronto at the time. I was just one year old. And uh, the day of, uh, I think it was maybe the day before the game, we were down at the uh, Pearson Airport. We were getting on the plane. And who was surrounding us at the terminal but the most famous men in Canada? Team Canada. You know, all the players. Esposito. Esposito, Henderson, and uh, the, the, the goalie. And uh, well, there was a there was an Esposito goalie as well, uh, as well as Dryden, and uh, and so we got onto the plane, and they were just flying commercially with us. Alan Eagleson yeah. was on the plane, and uh, and and who? Who apparently said something charming to your mother? Yeah, it was that, a well, strange anecdote. Because of course, my mom was stopping all. My mom was very gregarious, right. and she was stopping them all, and uh, knew uh, Ken Hodge, the whole deal. And then right in front of us, in the the row in front of us. Uh, on on one side, I think it was the road runner, uh, the window seat, uh, Yvon Cornoyer. And then on um, the aisle side, it was a... a Cashman. Uh, yeah. And then in the middle, it was none other than Canada's uh, most famous hockey player at that time, Bobby Orr. Yeah. Wondrous Bobby Orr. Now, he was not playing in the series because he was just coming off knee surgery, but he went along with the team uh, for the Canadian leg uh, to uh, for support. And they needed it at that time. And my mom, I was a baby at the time, and my mom pretty much passed me like a bag of pucks into the softest hands in hockey. Well, but you, in the book, you say Bobby Orr asked, can yeah, I, can I yeah. hold the baby? Can yeah. I hold the baby? Yeah. And so my mom pretty much threw me <laughs> uh, into his his arms uh, as a, as a one-year-old. And I spent the duration of the flight uh, between Toronto and, and Winnipeg, which back in the 70s was about five hours. <laughs> and uh, on Bobby Orr's yeah, Here's lap. the part. It's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? At one year old, you're, you're... Here's the part where, I'm sorry, this is embellished. Okay. I, go, I believe it's embellished. Because... I, I'm i sure that you were on that flight yeah. with your parents, and yeah. I'm sure the players yeah. were there. And I'm sure even that Bobby Orr yeah. said, can I hold the baby? Sure. He did not have you on his lap yes. for the whole yes. flight. I don't believe okay, that well, for a second. First Why all, would Bobby Orr hold you for the whole flight? Because I was a delightful, <laughs> charming baby. And I would coo, and I wouldn't cry. For two and a half hours, uh, Bobby Orr what, held you. Whatever the length of the flight was. And and so, yeah, I mean, he coddled me, uh, you know? And I think I was passed around a little bit as well. well but but, but right. so that baptism uh, on the lap of, of Canada's great, arguably Canada's greatest hockey player, uh, should have led me into yeah. a, a life, uh, so my parents thought, a life of, of sporting glory. But and there are some really charming and, and comical anecdotes in this book, but it, there's also some dark and, and difficult stuff. And, and the hockey dream... Mm -hmm. um, very quickly as a kid goes sour for you. Can you give us a sense of why? Yeah, well, basically, I mean, I had these these athletic parents, uh, but I was I came out a runt. I mean, I was the shortest kid in school. I wore uh, I had to, my knees dislocated. I had to wear squeaky knee braces uh, when I ran. It sounded like I had a litter of hamsters in my pants, and I had gigantic glasses. I mean, huge, like as if my cheeks were nearsighted. And so I was a target. And, and if I ever was to approach those big guys in the hockey jackets, which I, which I associated with intimidation and, and fear, unfortunately, uh, they said, all right, if you want to play, you play goalie. 
And that was, for many, many years, the runt's position. Mm. And I think uh, heroic figures like Patrick Waugh and Roberta Luongo have, have somewhat changed that perception. But when I was growing up, it was the, it was the position where you were the target. Right. And so, you know, I mean, the guys who would take shots at me would take equal pleasure scoring a goal or pinging the glasses off my face. Uh, which was uh, rather traumatic. And you um, kind of had no choice but to play hockey. That was the expectation. Uh, this is what you, you know, I mean, I I refused after a point. I mean, you know, if I wanted to kind of be with the, the gang, uh, it was uh, play hockey. But I, I, I realized pretty quickly that I couldn't stand. Uh, I, I, you know, it was strange because at home, you know, my parents are original Vancouver Canucks season ticket holders. And the, on Saturday night, the white noise of... Hockey Night in Canada would wash over me every right. week. But I, I it, there was this dichotomy at school where, you know, on TV there were supposed to be these legendary heroes. But at school, all the guys associated and, and who were apparently the best at hockey were the biggest, I'll say, let's say a, a kind word, jerks. In, and so I, I, I had a real struggle with, with that. Well, it's, it's an interesting polarity. one because uh, um, we do, we are surrounded, and we do, we're part of it at the CBC here. Mm -hmm. We put, you know, Absolutely. Hockey Day in Canada, we're surrounded by these idyllic images of, of hockey for kids and how, and, and, and my, I mean, I loved playing hockey for, for many years, but, but, uh, but I had a not dissimilar situation mm -hmm. to you, and you, you've, I've written about it in my book in terms of that's where a lot of the bullying happened, for, uh, you know, in terms of directed towards me and, and, I also got just got worse each year. You know, when I was like eight years old, when I first came to Canada, we, I was uh, not bad, and then I just because uh -huh. I'm, I'm not a normal size, and, and yeah, they, they, and they, I just kept on getting giants. bigger. Yeah, yeah, I just got worse and worse. But and, and it was and it was something I feared almost. Mm -hmm. For the, sure. the image of kids in hockey is even enshrined on the back of the Canadian five dollar bill. There's yeah, this was. portrait of children. Well, yes, yeah, now right. it's the Canada playing the, the the game on a frozen pond. Do you find that problematic? These these images of yeah, hockey? I mean because it's it's something that we are born into uh, in in Canadian culture, and and there is a dark side to it, and uh, where. Uh, on on the five dollar bill, or uh, as we see on Hockey Night in Canada, everything is heroic and everything is uh, done with a smile. Uh, but but there is a, 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 a darkly competitive side to it, where unfortunately, uh, at a young age, it tends to occur, and uh, not always, but certainly in my experience growing up, uh, it, it tends to occur within a team where kids are right. stepping on each other and, and bullying each other within the team. And I couldn't handle that at all, and I had to get as far away from it as humanly possible, which eventually led me to the arts. Grant, tell me, tell me about documenting your, your struggles against bullies. throughout. The, the, a lot of these stories are, are shockingly raw, mm -hmm. uh, and they're very personal. Uh, tell me about the decision to go there in such a, a, a brutally honest way. Uh, you know, I, I certainly it's not any. Uh, I'm not tr trying to be too precious about it. I'm also not trying. I'm not looking for sympathy. Uh, I like to. Uh, I, I suppose I like to look back at myself and laugh. I look back <laughs> at photos of myself and go, "Oh my lord." I was such an uber geek, and my mom would say, no, those glasses were really in fashion at the time. <laughs> Maybe for an adult man, a seven-year-old, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, so I, this is, your reaction has been a reaction that I've heard uh, from a lot of people, like, geez, these stories are really intense. But I suppose I didn't realize how intense they were until I received yeah. some reaction. I mean, maybe one, uh, there was one where I unfortunately had my very own BB gun turned on me and, uh, and I actually, uh, in fleeing the person who took uh, the BB gun from me wearing a hockey jacket, I ran right off the edge of a cliff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you do that as a, as a young teenager, you think, okay, well, I fell off a cliff. I bashed my head. I wrecked my knees, but you know, now I now I'm going to recover because you kind of live in the moment as a teenager. But writing about that incident, I realized, geez, this could have been it. Like I could have easily died. And I think my parents realized the urgency of the situation in the moment because my dad freaked out, rushed me to the hospital. But at the time, I was just like, well, I fell off a cliff. Another 
loser moment for me as a teenager. But so that that was a shocking moment uh, in realization. But you do you do gravita- gravitate away then from the lonely end of the rink. You you move uh, you, you leave hockey behind and yeah. you go on to play in a rock band and become a journalist and uh, a, a CBC host and and of course you're in the Smugglers, the the rock band for many years. Uh, then you're lured back to hockey, and 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 see, I've never known you as not a hockey guy. Right. I know you're yeah. a huge Canucks fan and such a big supporter of that team. How how did you come back to hockey? Well, I mean, I think I got to credit two people specifically. Uh, one is uh, my friend and mentor Dave Bedini, who's been a great supporter of uh, my writing career, and uh, the first guy I ever interviewed at CBC, actually. And then uh, he he, I started seeing um, him him combining. Uh, hockey and rock. I thought, well, this is weird. He really, uh, Rio Statics had a song about Wendell Clark. I thought, they're writing about that mustachioed dude from the Leafs? Are you kidding me? The guy who always wants to fight Trevor Linden? And then... Uh, and then I, the 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 Hanson brothers combined uh, punk rock and and hockey, uh, and then the real turning point was a guy named Tom Goodwin here in Vancouver. Or sorry, excuse me, here in Toronto. Where am I? And uh, he said that he has he had formed a tournament. Uh, for uh, artists that had been turned away or, or repulsed from hockey at, at a stage of their life, whatever it may be, 10, 13, 18, 20. And it was called the Exclaim Hockey Summit of the Arts, and it brought um, teams from all across Canada uh, featuring members of people like the Bare Naked Ladies and Sloan and Sam Roberts were all in it. And that kind of blew my mind. And he said, well, look, if if you're missing this piece of what is supposedly Canada's right of winter sporting passage, then go home to Vancouver and form a team. Own it. Uh, you know, you know, it's kind of like um, yeah. living, live life on your own terms. If you were pushed away and you want it, do it. And so year after year, I'd cover the tournament for CBC. And he'd say, oh, come on, you haven't done it yet. Do it. <laughs> so finally... I went back to Vancouver, and it was kind of like a cross between a slap shot and the commitments. <laughs> I sort of put the word out. And sure enough, musicians came out of the woodwork and said, well, you know, I played hockey in Thunder Bay yeah. until it, it, it got too rough. Or I played in Winnipeg. I played here. And we formed the Vancouver Flying Vs, named after the iconic Gibson guitar and kind of a tribute to the uh, hockey lore in Vancouver. And it's now been over 10 years of me being on this team. And if someone told me that I would be goalie on a beer league hockey team for, for 10 years, when I was 10 or 13 or 15, I would probably burst into tears mm. and say, you are insane. Why are you trying to torture it's a, me? It's a very affectionate portrayal, too, of, of, of the, the power and the community of beer league hockey, too, in this country. It, it is. Uh, I've got 30 seconds, well, just over that, left with you here. And I, I'm very curious to ask you, you and Jill, your, your wife, mm-hmm. uh, singer-songwriter Jill Barber, recently had your first baby, little um, uh, Joshua. Yes. <laughs> uh, what will be, what less? Lessons will you impart to him when it comes to hockey? Well, I think the word that that we need to uh, use when moving forward in hockey in Canada, especially at a young age, is empathy. Uh, and that words, uh, even words, I'm not so much physical actions, but words stick. And I, I think that um, with Joshua, my parents forced me to learn how to skate. Uh, and, and that was the tool for me that I kind of needed to, to be in a beer league much later in life. So I will force my son Joshua to learn how to skate. But when it comes to team sports, I'll let him know that he doesn't have to be the best because that's when kids step on each other. He just has to have fun, and if he has fun, he can play it. If he doesn't want to play it, he doesn't have to. Author, radio host, musician, beer league goalie, Grant Lawrence, thank you.